We will read today in Jonah chapter 1. So uh, let's go ahead and open our, our Bibles there. We will need them. Jonah chapter 1. And uh, let's go ahead and start in prayer. The Lord be with you. Father, I thank you for um, this day. I thank you for bringing us here. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll use this time that we have together in the scriptures. Uh, you'll use it to um, correct us, rebuke us, change us, transform us. Uh, Lord, I especially pray for those of us who um, have, have or are in the process of um, running, rebelling, or defying you. Um, I pray that you give us a call back to you, that you um, lead us back to you. And I pray also that um, we're able to see um, in our lives the signs of your mercy. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now Anne, last week, went all the way from chapter, I mean, chapter 1, verse 4, to chapter 1, verse 17. That would have taken me about uh, five Sundays, six Sundays. She did it in one sermon. I was amazed at that. Um, and I, I felt cheated. I want to go back, and uh, I'm not going to. But I, I'm going to go back just a little bit to set the stage for where we're going to be today. We're going to spend a lot of our time in verse 17, um, but I want to kind of set the stage for that by just picking back up in verse 13 of chapter 1. And um, going from there. Now, Jonah's in the boat, and the storm on the way to Tarshish. The storm's intensity has increased. Um, the sailors in the boat have thrown their cargo overboard because the storm is so great. They want to lighten the load. Um, their voyage, therefore, is a loss. Any kind of profit or gain they'd hope to make from their voyage is done. It's nil. They're not going to make anything. Um, and they've begun to fear for their lives. They cried out, you'll see in verse 5, they cried out to their gods, and their gods prove unhelpful, to say the least. They're not doing anything uh, to get them out of the, the problem, so that doesn't work. They're desperate, desperate people on this boat. And they've heard now, thanks to Jonah's reluctant admission. Now remember, Jonah was down there sleeping, and he didn't want to come up and tell them about Yahweh. He wasn't the great evangelist. He was reluctantly um, brought up onto the deck, and he did reluctantly tell them that he served Yahweh, the God of heaven um, and earth and the seas. Um, you see that in verses 8 and 9. So they've heard of the true God. They know that Jonah is his servant. And more importantly for our purposes today, you'll notice that in verse 10, it seems, because they're afraid at Jonah's admission of who he serves, it seems to be that these sailors actually believe not only that Yahweh exists, but that the storm was caused and is caused by Yahweh, and therefore their lives hang um, in the balance of what God will do um, in the next few um, moments. They believe that, in fact, Yahweh, Jonah has been the cause of this storm and that Yahweh has brought it. The only hope, therefore, for them um, to please Yahweh and to save their lives, Jonah tells them this, is for them to hurl Jonah into the sea. Jonah says that in verse 12. Now notice, they don't doubt that. They, they agree, with, they think that he's telling the truth. But they hesitate. Verse 13 tells us, Nevertheless, the men rode hard, rode hard to get back to dry land. Why? I mean, I, that's, I, me too. I would have thrown the guy in a long time ago. Why are these guys, why are they, these guys waiting and holding back? Why are they not doing the only thing that can save them? Well, part of the answer is in verse 14, where you see their prayer to God, and they say, lay not on us innocent blood. Now, Jonah is not innocent. 
before God. They know that. We know that. But I think what they mean is that he's a human being who's committed no crime or offense against them. How can they throw him overboard? And what that would mean is they would throw him over and they would have to sit there and watch the guy you know, flounder and try to, try to swim and they would have to watch him drown. He's a man like they are. They're in, quote unquote, the same boat with him. It's bad, I know, it's bad. I know. <laughs> they don't want him to die. They don't want to die themselves, and they certainly don't want to be responsible for his death. What we see here is that these sailors, they're compassionate. They're merciful to Jonah. They fear God. They're utterly unlike Jonah in every way. Now, I wonder whether, as the sailors struggle to save Jonah's life, Jonah sees the irony here. I doubt it, but I just wonder if he sees it. He's done all in his power to escape acting as God's emissary of mercy to pagans. He's exerted every effort. And now, pagans are doing all in their power. They're exerting every effort to show Jonah mercy. Now, if he's paying attention, and I doubt it again, if he's paying attention, this is a bright, gaudy, flashing, neon sign from God to Jonah. These pagans undermine his belief that God elected Abraham and his descendants because they're more virtuous than the other nations. Have you ever noticed that sometimes people who don't know Jesus act more like Jesus than the people who do? God gives every human being a conscience and a, a sense of right and wrong and the basic power to act, not imperfectly, imperfectly of course, but to act in accordance with that conscience. Whether a person is a believer or not, human beings have that capacity. It's called common grace. It doesn't save you, but it does allow for the world, to people in the world, to basically obey laws, not murder each other, not always cheat on each other. We have a basic conscience and a basic sense of right and wrong that you can, even if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, follow. And often people who are not believers follow it better than people who are. People without Jesus can live lives that are as good and decent and respectable on the outside, at least, as our own. That's very important for us to see and remember as we go outside these walls. We've got to be careful not to speak and to act as if the good people are in here and the bad people are out there. And that if only more of the bad people out there would come in here with us good people, then maybe possibly they could be good like us and no longer bad like they were. That's sometimes how evangelism is done in the church. That's sometimes the message that people hear from Christians. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Some people hear that kind of talk and they say, no thanks, actually my life is a lot better than yours. And I'm not a self-righteous jerk about it. So I think I'll stay outside the church. Thank you. Christianity is not about being good. Good behavior without Jesus actually 
gets you nowhere. Because good deeds flowing out of an unsurrendered, self-focused heart produce only pride and self-sufficiency. The sins that led to our rebellion originally. So if we go out and say, become a Christian, that way you can stop doing drugs, or that way you can stop sleeping around, or that way you can stop doing this, or stop doing that, and be like me, we are sending the opposite, the wrong message to people. Not that it wouldn't be great if they got off drugs and stopped sleeping around, sleeping around and stopped doing whatever. That's fine, wonderful, good. I hope that happens. But that's a little bit like me saying, hey, you know what? Um, before I was married, my dorm was a wreck. And now that I'm married, my house is clean. Fine. What am I missing? If I tell you that. I'm missing the fact that I met a woman who changed my life. I, had, I, I was introduced to somebody who made everything different in my life. Uh, it, was, it was not that I just started, I started cleaning after I became married. Well, get married so you can clean your house. <laughs> I was utterly transformed and changed by this relationship that I have with my wife. The gospel is not come to Jesus and be good or be good so that you can come to Jesus. That's hell. That's not the gospel. Because no one can be good enough for that. The gospel is Jesus saves rebel sinners. Both respectable, good, decent rebel sinners and drug dealers and prostitutes and all those. Not because we're good and deserve to be saved, but because he's good and has compassion on those who do not deserve to be saved. God wants that truth to sink into our bones. To sink into our bones. That is the point of, of Jonah. We have received, as believers in Jesus Christ, if you are, we've received grace upon grace. It's unmerited gift, unmerited gift from God. We've received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So how can we possibly, possibly refuse to be ambassadors of God's grace and his offer of mercy to those around us? Which is what Jonah did. All right, back to our text. Ultimately, the sailors have no choice. And so they pray, you see this in verse 14, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Now the sailors correctly recognize the strengthening tempestuous sea as an expression of God's will. God has shut off every other avenue of escape, and by his prophet, he's told them what they need to do. Right? So God's will is clear here. Through his words spoken by the prophet, and through the actual circumstances of the sea, they know there's no other way. They know there's no other way but to throw Jonah overboard. And yet they still tremble. They're still afraid. And you might notice, and I hope you do, that in this prayer, something remarkable has begun to happen or has happened. Now, I don't know about your Bibles. If they should, if they're good English translations. They may not, though. The word Lord in your Bibles should be capitalized. Every letter should be capitalized in that word. Um, does everyone see that? That indicates that in Hebrew... Um, the sailors are either speaking Hebrew or they're in some way, this has been communicated to them by Jonah or whatever, they're using, they're appealing to God, they're crying out to God using the personal name that God gave to his people to use. 
Yahweh. So they're using. So the sailors have gone from crying out to false gods who could not help them, to crying out to and seeking to do the will of Yahweh. They've now, in verse 14, thrown themselves on the mercy of Yahweh, seeking his help, seeking his mercy, seeking his grace. Now, through the prophet Joel, God says this, chapter 2, verse 32, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, in Joel, chapter 2, that refers to a kind of material salvation. You'll be saved from death. You'll be saved from uh, pain. You'll be saved from suffering. In the New Testament, this promise is applied by Luke and by Paul not merely to physical life, but to eternal life. And what they say is, everyone, whoever cries out to the Lord, as these sailors have done, and seek in truth and sincerity his mercy and his grace, shall be saved eternally. Now, you might be saying, as you're reading this text, now, come on. You know, obviously these guys are not thinking about eternal life. They're just thinking about life. They want, to, they want to save their skins. And so they're crying out to the only thing they have left to cry out to, which is this Yahweh. What are you doing reading all of this salvation stuff into their prayer? Well, that's true. They are crying out to Yahweh to save their skin. They're desperate. But... This desperation has made them willing and prepared to surrender wholly and completely to Yahweh. Notice in verse 16, after God calms the storm. Now, I don't know about you, but in my life, when I cry out to God and God calms the storm, in my life, my general tendency is to say, all right, see you, Lord, thank you. I'm going to go about my business now. Right? That's not what we see the sailors doing. They are making commitments. They're offering sacrifices in verse 16. And importantly, they're making vows. That points to these sailors making personal commitments to devote their lives to this God of the sea and of the sky who saves them. So I think what we see in verse 14 is a true cry for real mercy, both physical and in every way possible, and they're going to commit their lives to this God who, who can grant them mercy. You see, I don't think God is against deathbed conversions or against foxhole conversions or against last breath conversions. Some of us get a little bit, I don't know, Upset by that, how can this person live his whole life being a jerk and a, a, a horrible person and then at his deathbed say he's sorry and give God lets him off free? That doesn't seem fair. But God <clears throat> does not think that way. God will gladly, God will with pleasure, God will with joy and happiness sink you into a miry hole of trouble and turmoil and pain and suffering to the point that you're willing to drop your idols and cry out to him and surrender. He's happy to do that. He does that every day. And he does that so that he can deliver you and grant you mercy. It's a good thing to be in a place of desperation where all you can do is cry out to the Lord. In fact, putting you in a hole, hurling the unrelenting storm in your direction, in our direction, is mercy in some ways. It would have been far worse for these sailors had they never met Jonah. It would have been far worse 
for these sailors had they continued serving their idols to the end of their lives and died in their sins and been condemned. But instead, God used this horrid prophet. He was a horrible prophet, a bad, bad prophet. God used this horrid prophet. God used this terrible storm. God used this near-death experience to bring this boatload of miserable pagans to faith and into his eternal kingdom. It's an amazing thing. So don't ever begrudge God the turmoil he brings you. If you're his child, that's there for a purpose and for a good one. He wants you to lean even more heavily, even more strongly on him and not yourself. It's often mercy drawing you from self-reliance and from your idols to him. Now, I don't know what Jonah was thinking when he heard the sailors cry out to Yahweh, but given that that is precisely what he's got on this trip to avoid, I mean, he's been running away from having to have pagans be saved, and here he is in this ship, and they're calling out to Yahweh, his God. He's got to be frustrated, but they're all get out about this. Um, here they are praying to non-Jews, worshiping and worshiping, praying to Yahweh. Um, and it's happening on a boat in the middle of a storm on the way to Tarshish, of all places. He must, if I were him, be eager to be cast into the sea. Please throw me out now. I don't want any more of this. Let me go. Um, and so we don't know what he's thinking. That's just my own uh, uh, speculation. We have to remember, though, that Jonah doesn't know about the fish. Right, we know about the fish. We've read this book over and over again. We know about the fish. Jonah doesn't know about the fish. It's important to remember that. Jonah thinks he is going to die. And as Anne pointed out last week, he would rather die than obey God. Right? Chapter 4, kill me now, Lord. You're not going to destroy Nineveh? Just take me out. There's where he is. He would rather die. From a judicial standpoint, from a God uh, in his relationship to us standpoint, he's defiantly disobeyed the word of the Lord, and so he deserves to die. I mean, so both by his desire and by his desert, he should be gone. He should be done, done for. But we read in verse 17 the opposite. Or not the opposite. It wasn't necessarily a fun thing, but we learn that something else happened in verse 17. The Lord appointed a great fish, a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now, this week we are not going to be able to get, we will get into this next week, but we will not be able to get into whether or not this was a parabolic fish or a metaphorical fish or a historical fish. I'll tell you where I stand now. It's a historical fish, but we'll talk about why that is next week. I'm not going to talk about that now. I want to focus on the, the, the account I had hoped to do that this week, but I didn't get there. Um, now, notice again the words. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Profundity in the Bible is often delivered in very simple language. If you read the accounts of Jesus' resurrection, like the women show up and, hey, it seems empty. You know? And then Jesus was standing behind them. <laughs> I mean, if the 21st century writer was writing that stuff, we'd have like this, this huge, long, five-page description. But here in the Bible, it's very simple. So here we have a simple description of... Oh, yeah, and God appointed a whale, uh, excuse me, not a whale, a fish to swallow up Jonah. The Lord had mercy on the sailors, and now the Lord has mercy on Jonah. The fish is Jonah's ark. The fish is Jonah's salvation. Now, the sequence of events here is important. And we're going to look at them closely. So look down first at verse 16, which is the one, of course, before verse 17. And you will notice that the sailors throw Jonah overboard in that text. And as soon as that happens, the waves, the sea seems to go flat. The, the, the storm is calmed. Now there's a really important image here that we're going to get to in a minute. But right now, skip over verse 17 and look at chapter 2, 
And you'll see the prayer that Jonah prayed from inside the fish. If you look at verse 3 through verse 7, you'll notice that in this prayer he recounts what happens immediately after he hits the water before being swallowed. Now, I don't know if you've ever been close to drowning. Anyone here been close to drowning? It's real scary. It's not, it's not it's a panicky thing. It's a desperate feeling. And you can hear that in Jonah's recounting of the event. He says, The flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. The storm currents, it seems like, or the waves suck him down into the deeps. The waters, he says, closed over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. He looks like he's tangled in seaweed here. It wrapped about his head at the roots of the mountains. His is a hopeless situation. All hope for him is lost. But look um, at verse 7, especially. When my life was fainting away, I was about to lose consciousness here. He's all, it's almost gone. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. So here's a sequence. The sailors hurl Jonah overboard. Jonah sinks. God quells the storm. Verse 16. Jonah goes down into the depths. He prays. That's chapter 2, verses 3 through 7. God saves him. Verse 17 of chapter 1. Now let's work through this sequence and then, and then we'll be finished. I just want to lay out how, that, how the whole event took place. I said there's an important image in verse 16 that we don't want to miss. So let's look at that first. Jonah's sin. Jonah's sin was the cause of the storm. It aroused God's wrath. That was displayed in the storm. The storm would have destroyed both Jonah and the boat full of idolaters that were in the boat. Because everyone was guilty there. Jonah was guilty of running from God and disobeying his voice, and the sailors were guilty of idolatry. But Jonah willingly offered himself to death here, in verse 16, to satisfy God's justice and to bring peace between God and the men on the boat. Now, Jonah is no Jesus. Of course, I'm not saying that. Obviously. But when you see images like this in the Bible, you shouldn't ever ignore them. God is casting a shadow of his son against the wall. Through the sin of one man, Adam, everyone on this boat became subject to sin and condemned to endure eternally the storm of God's wrath. But God himself stepped onto the deck in the one man, the second Adam, Jesus, who willingly cast himself to death in our place and bore himself the storm of fury and the wrath that should be ours to bear. The cross is right there. Hundreds of years before it happened. And through his sacrifice, Jesus made peace between God and humanity so that all who call on him may be saved. It's no, no accident that Jesus repeatedly goes back to Jonah and says, Hey, this generation wants a sign. My sign is going to be the sign of Jonah because in so many ways, Jonah precedes or, or gives a type of Christ in the Old Testament. So God in Christ hurled himself into the grave, but we know he didn't remain there, and neither did Jonah. So let's now turn to see what Jonah's experience was after he left the boat. He was hurled into the ocean. He was feeling his life slip away, as we said. He's feeling desperation. He's feeling fear. He's feeling panic. And that brought to Jonah something he, that brought Jonah to do something he'd not done in a very, very long time. He prayed. Cried out to God, just as the sailors did. And God was waiting for this moment. 
And we're told in verse 17 that God appointed a fish for Jonah. That word could also be translated prepared. Prepared in advance. He appointed a fish for Jonah. He prepared a place for him. God put Jonah, in fact, in the sea at that time for that purpose. So that when Jonah, in desperation, finally lifted up his heart toward home, his father had already seen him coming from a long way off and had already prepared a place for him. Grace. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever walked or felt like you've walked so far away from God? And I'm not just talking to believers, I'm talking to non-believers, whoever, whoever you are. Have you ever walked so far away from God in the way you're living, that prayer, that crying out to Jesus Christ, that even coming to church maybe, that seeking God out in any way seems presumptuous? I'm in this terrible place because I've turned from God. I've, I've defied him. I've sinned. I've messed up so bad. And now my life is the way it is because, it's, because I've done these things. I've, I've put myself in this position. So how can I cry out to God for mercy to help me out of this pit? I've dug it myself. I'm in it. I'm bearing the consequences for my sins. So why should I expect God to help me? I should just bear up. How can I cry out to him for mercy? Well, I don't know where you are in your life, but if that is you, you may in fact be bearing consequences for some kind of rebellion. But the truth is, you won't be able to work it out by yourself. The truth is, you are where you are because God is sovereign and in control over all things and has put you exactly there. We serve a gracious and a merciful God who put you right where you are so that you would do exactly what you see Jonah doing as consciousness slips from him. You cry out, Lord, help me. Lord, I, I need you to rescue me. You're never too dirty. You're never too mired in sin never too surrounded by the turmoil of your own making, too, never too far gone. God delights, he loves to deliver us from the pits that we dig ourselves. He loves that. So cry to him. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Whether you're his defiant servant, a Christian who's decided to walk your own way, or whether you're someone who's never cried out to Jesus in your life, if you do so, the Lord will deliver you and he will save you and he will lift you out. The question is not, will God deliver me since I'm a sinner? That question's answered easily, yes. The question is, how are we going to respond to God's deliverance? That's the question we're left with in verse 17, and kind of a cliffhanger. Jonah has received mercy. This unmerciful, horrible prophet has been saved by pure, pure grace of God when he deserved to die. How will he respond? Will he become merciful and compassionate or not? Okay, we'll stop here. Next week, we'll begin to look at the answer to that question. And we'll also, uh, next week, begin to see, what, or we'll look at whether or not this fish is real or metaphorical. So, uh, let's go ahead and pray. And then we'll close. Lord be with you. Father, I, I thank you for, um, for your mercy, for your grace, for your long-suffering. I know there are times in my life, I know there are times in um, all of our lives, Defied you, walked from you, lived uh, apart from you, at least to the extent that we can. And um, those are the times when we sometimes don't feel worthy to even call.
call out your name and cry out to you. Lord, we're not worthy. But you're a God of grace. And wherever we are, you set us there for one purpose. For one purpose. That we'll cry out to you for deliverance. Lord, I pray for everyone here who might be in a desperate situation. Pray that you move them to faith. Move them to your son, Jesus. Move them to cry out to you in the sure knowledge that you are a merciful